See this beautiful ocean behind us? Well, take a good look at it because tomorrow it might be gone. Uh, say again? Yeah, that's right. The party is over. This is it. We sucked everything we possibly could out of it. We annihilated every precious resource it hosted. This water will soon be home to just plastic bags and toothbrushes, and it will barely produce enough oxygen for us to breathe. We're all gonna die, and it's all our fault, guys, for not putting our recycled waste in the right bin last Monday and drinking our margarita with a plastic straw. All right, that's a bit much, don't you think? Remember what we said? We would empower people with solutions, not drown them in paralyzing guilt? Yeah, sorry. Well, let's start from the beginning, once this exhausted Frenchman welcomes everyone. Bienvenue dans un nouvel épisode. So, look at this. This endless blue. At times, it can be hard to imagine that about 70% of the planet's surface is covered by oceans. Home to countless species, providing food security for billions of us, and even regulating our climate, this ecosystem does practically everything for us. Unfortunately, this vast mesmerizing world is in big trouble. Between global warming, pollution, and overfishing to name a few, the damage we're doing to this fragile ecosystem is reaching its tipping point and will soon become irreparable. Made up of more than 17,000 individual islands, Indonesia is particularly vulnerable to these threats. With an expanding fishing industry and a booming mass tourism sector, Indonesia is struggling to protect its most pristine coral reefs and remaining marine life sanctuaries. Geared up with cameras, oxygen tanks and sexy swimsuits, we decided to take the plunge and meet with some of those who fight every day to preserve this complex yet vital ecosystem. The oceans are massively important to the world and to our survival. We don't realise the effects of our actions because it's kind of below the surface and it's something that we don't have to see every day. On one end you have in the water and then you have onto land and then you have everything that is connected to each other in these small kind of chains along the way. If we change the chemistry of our ocean, if we change the biodiversity, if we change these things in the ocean, we're going to be changing the quality of the air that we breathe and of our life source. There's so many different problems that are happening right now in terms of marine conservation. It's good that people kind of address all of them, but I find it's a little bit better when people focus on one. We'll meet all together on the surface and go down together, okay? This ecosystem, all of that would be gone if sharks weren't there. Like in any ecosystem, you'll have something at the top of the food chain. So sharks are there and they have a really important role. So some sharks that we have on our planet now have been here and looked like that for 150 million years. This is what we like to call evolutionarily perfect. They didn't need to change because they were already perfect. Sharks are an apex predator. They don't have a lot of things that eat them. And they eat a lot of different species. They're feeding on the sick and the weak of the prey because that's the easiest for them to catch. So they're keeping the next generation of fish strong and healthy, the kind of genes that you want to pass on to the next generation. We have 500 species of them. Most are predators, some are scavengers, and a few are filter feeders, like our whale shark and our basking shark. The problem is that sharks, even though they're a fish, they're often clumped into the same group and the same um, fisheries management strategies as bony fish, but their life history traits and the way that they live their life is totally opposite. Sharks are a lot more like large mammals, like us, or like elephants and other mammals that take a lot longer to reproduce and therefore take a lot longer to get the population back in check.
this is the coral triangle. This is where the most biodiversity of sharks should be happening in the world. On the planet, hands down, this is where it should be. But they're not here. It's been a pretty hot topic in conservation for a couple decades now. 30% of all assessed sharks are considered in the red zone by the IUCN, saying that something steps need to be taken in order to protect these creatures or they're going away. Here in Nusa Penida, the MPA's Marine Protected Area says it's a shark sanctuary, in loose terms. There's no fishing of sharks in this entire MPA, but they're caught. White tip reef sharks, black tip reef sharks are seen in the market every day. I've seen hammerheads there, fresher shark there, mako sharks, tiger sharks. Do we know the, the rank of Indonesia regarding shark fishing in the world? Or? It's the highest in the world. It's the highest in the world. You would be surprised how often shark products creep up into Western and national markets. It's used often as this filler meat inside uh, these frozen fish fingers that we buy at our fish markets. Indonesia has the most amount of environmental laws, and if they obeyed all of those laws, this would be the most environmentally sound country in the world. Instead, we have illegal manta ray fishing and whale shark fishing, which are some of the most endangered species. Previously, there used to be a lot of images coming out of the Tanjinglua market of, um, of manta rays being slaughtered like 100 on a day kind of thing. The main reason that sharks and mantas are being fished for shark fin soup which is to primarily to Hong Kong, Singapore, and China. And for, for mantas, it's for the gill rakers. And the gill rakers is a part of the gills that the mantas have. It's actually where they capture that plankton that they eat. And that's recently been described in Chinese medicine as something which can, can help you with certain illnesses you have. Very poor fishermen are getting a lot of money to, to take these gill rakers. And so obviously that's a big incentive for them to do that. When they're going out catching sharks, that's because it's, it's, the, it's the thing that gives them the most money. So they have no choice in some way to go out and do that because otherwise they've got no food for their family to put on the table. While these voracious economical markets push some fishermen to purposely target protected species, we cannot forget that Indonesia relies on fishing to feed its people. About 270 million people in Indonesia eat two to three times more fish than the average person. Adding to this, a growing global demand puts Indonesia in the top five fishing nations in the world. Catching fish at such high rates requires large-scale industrial methods, such as deep-sea trawling. Miles of nets are dragged along the bottom of the sea, capturing everything, including a significant amount of bycatch. 40% of wild fish are unintentionally caught, resulting in them being tossed back into the sea, left injured or dead. Until recently, the ripple effect of the fishing industry even pushed some of Indonesia's most secluded communities to implement new ways of fishing. This realization led us to meet with the Bajo people, a community depending directly on the sea for their survival. Once nomadic seafarers living on houseboats, the now settled community had hideously been practicing a particularly radical fishing method. But the people, they don't have a land. That's why the gypsy people decided to build a house on the top of the sea. Yeah. Before, in the village of Bajo, they used uh, so many dynamite. We have many damage in the sea. The coral in here, uh, so many damage because of uh, dynamite. If you go to the coral, there is snorkeling, you see many, many coral dead, totally white coral. The gypsy people, they don't know about the damage, you know, in the environment. A lot of people get very 
upset and angry with the fishermen and they get uh, they start pointing fingers and, and so on, but they forget that you're never going to get rid of fishing and nor should you want to. It's more about sustainability and, and fishing in, in the right way. This last decade has seen charities and international organizations create marine management programs. They encourage local communities to return to more sustainable and traditional fishing methods. For us, in the day, if we have like a net, we go net fishing. Sometimes we go for spear gun fishing. Maybe there's still people using dynamite, but not much as before. And now I see few of soft coral, they growing up. Yeah, few, few of them, yeah. While dynamite fishing may have offered higher yields in the short term, it rapidly depleted the reefs that sustained them. The return to sustainable practices may not eliminate all economic pressures, but it helped the Bajo people maintain their livelihoods while also safeguarding the marine environment for future generations. We're hitting the oceans from both sides right now, from the bottom and from the top. I mean, you start from the bottom and you work your way up, or you start from the top and you work your way down. Sharks are at the top, corals are primary producers at the bottom. So you take out those primary producers, it's going to affect all the way up to the top of the food chain. Coral reefs produce around 60 to 70 percent of the air that we breathe, so they're super important. Coral reefs are really, really important. They're called the rainforests of the sea, but they're actually way more productive than rainforests. They give uh, life to more than 33% of all of the ocean species, um, and a lot of pelagic ocean species will actually come to reefs to uh, reproduce, and their young will stay there to just be protected until they're big enough to go out into the open ocean. Coral reefs take up 1% of all of the ocean, but yet it has a larger diversity of any other ecosystem in the ocean. Rajan put one single reef has a higher diversity of corals than the entire Caribbean. It's where the highest biodiversity of corals are in the world. The corals that you see when you go snorkeling and things like that, they're made up of hundreds and thousands of these tiny animals, something called a coral polyp. It's in the same family as the jellyfish. They're kind of like an upside down jellyfish with the tentacles on the surface. They use the sunlight to make uh, energy. And at night time, they will let out their tentacles, the animals, and they will catch some uh, prey for themselves. They're very kind of fragile animals. They can make these amazing, beautiful structures, amazing colors. Coral is what we call an ecosystem engineer. It actually builds the ecosystem. The structure they create is like a nursery ground for small little fish. It's hiding spots for larger animals that are ambush predators. It just is the place to be for underwater uh, animal life. It's really hard when you start studying the different food chains in, in the ocean because everything is interconnected. So the manta ray or the sharks are coming in some reef to get clean. Cleaning station is um, an area of reef that uh, lots of animals will visit. It's a place on the reef, usually a kind of quite obvious part of the reef, like a big coral bommy, um, where lots of small fish live, which are our cleaning fish. And the mantas will visit this area of the reef and they'll circle around and all the fish will come out of the, the bommy and they will clean that manta so they'll bite off all the dead skin and the parasites, clean any injuries that they've got and it's kind of a win-win because the manta needs to be cleaned and the, the cleaner fish, that's what they like to eat, so that's their diet, so it's a, a symbiosis. 
because everything is interconnected, if you take one of the chain bit out, then the others can't link. For sure, we've seen adaptation, which are quite positive, but those mutations are so slow compared to the, the speed of destruction. The corals, they have tiny plants in the skin. They use the sunlight to make uh, energy. They can survive um, very well, but within a specific kind of um, limit of temperature change. Because of global warming, then you have climate change. And climate change is because of the ocean. The oceans are actually giving you the climate. In some years, because the Earth warms up so much, the main stream of current in the ocean are changing direction. Here, instead of having the cold current while it's the rainy season and it's really warm in the air, then we have the warm current called El Nino coming when the air is also super warm. Above 29 degrees, the cold start being stressed. When environmental conditions become unfavorable, so for example like the, the sea temperature raises or the light intensity that the sun is penetrating the water with uh, increases as well, that can actually cause the, uh, the coral to spit out that algae. That means that they can no longer get all the energy from the sun and they're only relying on getting um, the plankton from the water which they usually do at night time and that's taking about only about 10 or 20 percent of the energy they'd normally be able to get. So when it loses that algae, uh, it is not dead, but it's dying. It's at risk of dying from starvation. And then it actually goes that bleach white color. And that's why it's called bleaching. The first bleaching that scientists noticed was in 1994. But then 97, 98 was really bad. That's where scientists were like, okay, the, the earth is warming up and this is the proof. In 2015, there was all that news going around about how the Great Barrier Reef is classified as dead, which isn't the case, but a lot of the Great Barrier Reef was bleached. We don't even know if the corals are gonna rebound from this mass bleaching event. If you lose the coral and the coral dies, then there is no longer, the ecosystem is not there anymore, and so the ecosystem will just, uh, collapse. just collapse. From land to sea, these biomes are interconnected, forming a ballet in motion where each ecosystem has a specific role to play to keep everything in place. But one of them in particular caught our attention. Seagrass. Seagrass is probably the most underrated marine ecosystem. While most of us might consider it as an average looking underwater lawn, others who are more aware know it as the lungs of the sea. Not only does it produce a tremendous amount of oxygen daily, it also absorbs carbon up to 35 times faster than tropical rainforests. But for local Indonesian people, the importance of seagrass lies in other primary needs. Is the seagrass something very important that you take care of it as well? Uh, the seagrass for me is uh, very, very important because the fish can eat the seagrass, can hide in the, underneath the seagrass. Like uh, octopus, they go to the seagrass to find the food, to hide the, to lie the eggs. So we go fishing in the seagrass. They have to wait for low tide and they glean, gleaning to find the sea cucumber. You know, when they have sea cucumber, they take to the boat and sell it. As abstract as it might sound, 
saying that the survival of humanity is firmly linked to the well-being of these hidden and fragile ecosystems is no joke. We need to trigger a whole set of actions toward global awareness if we want to avoid this world-collapsing butterfly effect. I love diving. That's really where it came from, is that I just fell in love with the ocean, and the ocean gave me everything in my life, and I kind of hit a point where I had to do something for it. My thing was sharks. I was interested in sharks from day one. And then I found that, okay, well, swimming with sharks can also be useful in terms of the data that you can collect from them. So that got me asking questions. Why are people collecting data on sharks? So Indo-Ocean Project, it is a conservation project combined with local dive shops. We are offering non-profit dive master programs. Our participants come and our dive master trainees come for two, three months, sometimes more. They learn everything that it needs to take to become a dive master as well as uh, completing research diving courses. So we're doing our survey dive on this one. Okay, so we'll draw out our slates before we go. Um, and then hunting around for our indicator species, like our groupers. Of course, we're looking for sharks, turtles, mm -hmm. hammerheads, hammerheads maybe. Yeah. <laughs> the main shark that we're kind of targeting right now, especially in Indonesia, is uh, thresher, and the world, is thresher sharks and hammerhead protection. If, we, if there are hammerheads, they're gonna be at around 40, so keep your eyes out in the blue in the lower part. We go around looking for 30 centimeters and above, uh, which is kind of the fisheries targeted animals. And uh, then we write it all down and log it in our database and share it with a few different uh, local and international global. The global conservation is putting pressure on countries to protect these species. If we can kind of locate areas where they are, uh, provide useful, standardized, valuable data to show where they are, then we can have them stop being fish. Rajan Pite is one of the last paradises left on Earth and there's very little research being done. So we're pretty much just trying to see if it is in fact staying pristine, as pristine as it is, or if there are things that are happening uh, and what we could possibly do to change that. The project itself is based on pretty much uh, monitoring Rajan Pite as a whole. So our main activities here, uh, we do coral monitoring. Uh, we do that through a program called Reef Check, as well as Coral Watch. Our big task is a collaboration going with Queensland University. So it all gets sent to them, and this data just helps see like, the different zones and where the bleaching is worse, what times of year, and if there's any trends throughout each year, or whether it's just like a big event kind of thing, or becoming a seasonal thing. So Max and all the team are going to do Coral Watch here for a little bit. They are at a dozen of meters of depth. Ils vont faire des relevés scientifiques et bah moi je vais pas chanter et euh, je vais pas me plaindre parce que je crois qu'il y a pire comme ça d'attente. We do uh, manta monitoring uh, around the sites here and that would be our main science. Aujourd'hui c'est la deuxième tentative qu'on fait pour essayer d'observer de, des remanta. Cet endroit il a été récemment déclaré protégé par le gouvernement donc, au niveau plongée. C'est pas n'importe qui qui peut aller plonger là-bas et ça garantit une certaine préservation. On croise les doigts, on croise tout ce qu'on peut et on va voir si on trouve des éléments de passe. We're just looking at uh, the photos that Dan took the other day from a manta dive, and we're just looking at the spot pattern that they have by looking at the belly between the gills. So the spots are like their ID. Yeah, just like a fingerprint for the manta. This tracking has been really important in Indonesia because it's actually led to their um, protection essentially. So it's led to a countrywide ban on the actual fishing of manta rays.
So volunteers, we set up as staff members. We're all here for about six months. We set up the protocols for the diving protocols, the, the science protocols and the community protocols with the local villages. Eh, okay. on va à l'école en bateau. Ouais. <rire> enfin, ouais, j'ai jamais fait. T'es déjà allé à l'école en bateau toi Non, mais ça a l'air trop classe. Bon, bah on va à l'école en bateau. On va à l'école en bateau, c'est parti. <rire> We have like three islands to teach, but four school, including like high school. So we just go there and helping the teacher to teach them English. We also teach them about uh, science, especially like marine science and also waste management class. We also teach them about uh, trash. We teach them how to do beach cleanup from a plastic bottle, cup plastic, cap, glass can. And we teach them which one that you can recycle, which one you can't. Moi, j'allais pouvoir rentrer, hein? Moi, j'allais pouvoir rentrer dans le lit, on a trop de déchets avec nous, là. C'est assez impressionnant tout ce qu'on peut faire en 10 minutes, hein. Quand on a une armée d'enfants motivés, excités et, et motivés, j'ai dit deux fois déjà. They have to understand that this is really beautiful. They should protect it, protect the ocean, protect their island, and then maybe they can make it like a legacy to their kids. We do like a education to around not only school but also community. For kids, we drawing everything. Avec Max, on a créé un nouvel écosystème qui va un peu partout dans l'océan. Je pense qu'on est les premiers à les avoir identifiés comme écosystème. Il va falloir qu'on leur donne des noms. Ça, c'est le cocalopode. We will explain to the kids what we have uh, in this island. And then ask them what we have in Caledopa, like we have forests, we have uh, mangrove, we have seagrass, and also we have coral. So four of them is important for our life because one of them lost, it means we lost everything. We arrange a new approach to make them realize that actually they can do something. We need to make a community understand what happened with the seagrass, why we need to save the seagrass. With seagrass being largely ignored within environmental management frameworks, some projects are dedicated to ensuring the protection of seagrass globally. Okay. Nah, yang harus di yang itu yang ini toh. Simpan patok di sini satu. So this morning we will go to monitoring seagrass on the area. We need to take a photos of this to make sure about the seagrass composition or covering. And after that, we estimate from this quadrant how many percent of seagrass. We put in a computer, we send it to oh, our partner in the Cardiff. We will come here again in six months. So make sure the stick not lost okay. in a six month. Despite its importance, seagrass is disappearing fast. Their work consists in monitoring and mapping seagrass beds to track their current state, engaging with local communities and adopting better fishery management techniques to protect them. Maybe every people around the world, they know that seagrass is a plant. They produce oxygen, they do carbon dioxide, but here, no one cares about that. They just care where they get food. If they lose seagrass, it means they lose everything. There are people here and we're starting the conversation. From the locals, of course, from the Indonesian uh, community, as well as the tourists who are coming in. They leave here as ocean and shark advocates because 
projects like this are here and we're talking about the problems. And that's really kind of the basis of conservation is education and awareness. I went really into diving without having any idea if a coral was a rock or a plant or a what, right? And just by sitting on that 45 minute boat out to the dive site and talking with the dive professionals and talking with the guests and then sharing some knowledge and some stories and people really get sucked in on that. It's a bit of a drug. Cool. Okay, right. now you Ready know what we're doing. You. Here we go, here we go. It's definitely people get the bug, the dive bug. And when you get the dive bug, you want to start preserving it. Divers want to see sharks. Ask any diver, what do you want to see? They want to see a shark, you know? So if you can give them that, they're more likely to come back, they're more likely to tell people. It seems that governments listen when we start talking money, when we can put a dollar sign on the life of a shark. Lots of studies have been done over the last few years and the governments were shown that sharks are worth more alive than dead. So an example of that is in the Bahamas. Over a 20-year period, $800 million went back into the Bahamas, just directly related to shark tourism. So, as you can see in this Bahamas National Trust report, a shark is worth $250,000 over its lifetime for tourism, while it's worth only $50 as a one-time consumption product. Okay, let me do the math. So I multiply 250,000 by 50. Okay, we're obviously not math whizzes. But based on this report, a shark alive is worth a jaw-dropping 5,000 times more than a dead one. Surely it's a pretty solid argument that sharks make much better business partners than meals, right? It just makes financial sense. There are negatives and positives to every situation. With tourism brings in some positives and some negatives. As much as tourism economically improves the livelihoods of many people around the world, it comes with its share of environmental destruction. Indonesia is fairly new to tourism and has seen a steady growth for the last 50 years. We decided to have a closer look at one of the Indonesian islands that became a popular tourist spot. Gili Trawangan. The biggest problem that we have in, in Indonesia is, is waste management. That has come with an increase in tourism and with more people coming to the island. In high season, we are getting up to 3,000 tourists um, every day arriving on the beach in Gili Trawangan. It used to be that people were coming here just for scuba diving and relaxing on the beach. But now we do have um, a bit more of a social scene than we are getting people coming between three and five days. They're partying a lot and drinking a lot. And then they're leaving the island as well. This is more of the dark side of tourism. When tourism has started to boom, there hasn't really been any proper waste disposal or management put in place. They found an area in the middle of the island where people don't really go and see. And that's where all the rubbish ends up. We tried to recycle and separate all of the rubbish. So we're working with about 250 businesses now to collect the rubbish so we can send it off the island. What we're doing is actually selecting and collecting all of the recyclable waste, processing it very simply and compressing it. So we do send it off to, to China where they melt it down and then they make lower grade plastic items. We're finding uh, increasing amounts of glass waste. The bags of glass sand where we just found it being crushed are transported over here. And then by hand, we're actually mixing the glass sand with regular cement we can make around 80 to 120 bricks a day. We can sell them back to the businesses that are actually developing uh, on the island. So as they are developing their business, they're building their business back out of the waste, which means that they can actually mitigate their waste that they're making in the first place before they've even created it. It can hold a house, it can definitely hold you. <laughs> <laughs> 
we're trying to educate people who might not be going in the water about the ocean and about the importance of keeping the ocean clean. We uh, run beach cleans every week, so it's trying to be a kind of big social gathering where everybody cleans the beach for one hour. It's a really good chance for them to meet other backpackers that might be um, a little bit more inclined to look after the environment. Moi, je m'en sors pas trop mal. Mais bon, ça se remplit vite déjà, quoi. With a really poor infrastructure and poor waste management, it means that a lot of the trash on the larger islands go into dry riverbeds in the dry season. Then the first rains will actually flood all of the riverbeds um, and wash all of that into the oceans. The amount of plastic in the oceans is expected to double in the next 15 years. At this rate, 2050 could see more plastic than fish in our seas. And sadly, Indonesia is one of the world's top marine plastic polluters. Diving deeper, we found other contributors actively participating in this pile of trash from afar, with fishing and cruising industries being two of the heaviest polluters. It seems Indonesia is fighting an endless war against waste and pollution. Their poor environmental management practices leaves them overwhelmed and unable to adapt quickly enough to deal with the current crisis. Throughout the years, they have become a plastic dumping ground for Australia, Europe and North America's waste. Most of the pollution in Gilitrawangan is strikingly visible, and we were shocked to discover that another source of damage was taking place right under our noses. Around the Gili Islands specifically, we're getting a lot more tourism coming to the island, which brings a lot more of the smaller local boats. And what they're doing is actually dropping anchor on the coral reefs around the Gillies. When I arrived, the coral reef were really damaged. So I started to look into different reef restoration technology. So uh, the Bioroc technology is a very uh, special type of technology. We're actually building artificial reef structures out of steel rebar. Once we've welded them and, and created a structure and sunk it underwater, we're actually adding a little bit of electricity to it to boost the growth of the coral reefs. So the... C'est bon? Um, ouais, bio -rock, uh, the Bioroc technology, is it's it? an electrolysis using a saline solution and then two different metals, two different polarity of metals. And you'll put a direct current, so it's very low voltage electricity. And then one of the metal will disintegrate and the other one will grow. So we do the same with the barrack. We put steel structure, which is the cathode, and the anode, we use titanium because it lasts for 10 years. The titanium disintegrate really slowly, and the cathode is where we attach the hard coal on it, actually grow calcium carbonate. And calcium carbonate is also uh, the exoskeleton of the hard coal, okay, and also the best substrate for coal to grow on. And when you attach the coal on it, you can see the coal gluing onto the calcium carbonate, onto the steel, and then it, it becomes one, basically. So what we're going to be doing this morning is we're going to go and evaluate some of the corals that you've been researching and doing your coral bleaching on. Three weeks ago, we took some kids from a school in Gilead to attach some corals on some of the shallower bio rocks. So now that it's been two weeks since they were sunk, we're actually assessing to see the fatality and to see how much has survived. And if it has, then how we can help them to recover a bit quicker than usual. It 
if we do find lots of dead specimens and all of the colonies are kind of gone, it will turn into a new substrate for a natural colonization to happen on that. So it's not the end of the world, but the ones that we can save, we want to save. Double check that all their cable ties have actually been cable tied and attached properly to the biorox, or even to double attach a second cable tie over the top just to make sure they do stay in place. Sound okay? Because of this electrolysis, the corals will grow two to eight times faster. It also helps the corals to survive stress. The corals that are placed on these bio rocks, um, they've got a stronger resilience to um, some types of global warming. So that's why it's really important for us to uh, be trying to replenish the reefs with bio rocks um, and also to teach as many scuba divers that do come here how they can take care of the reefs and how they can rebuild the reefs for the future. There is no green without blue. If we do start disrupting the ocean currents, then we're going to start to see uh, more catastrophic events, bigger forest fires, bigger droughts, bigger monsoons and flooding in different places. Long before the first civilization arose, the oceans were already there at work, setting up the foundations for all life on Earth. But even though the oceans cover 70% of our planet, only 8% are protected. The advancement of the global north has been driven by the deliberate exploitation of the global south depleting entire ecosystems, upsetting the balance of the Earth and endangering countless lives. Today, around 3 billion people rely on the ocean for food security. And the damage to this vital resource would be irreversible if we don't act now. Being able to explore Indonesia and follow these people working locally really inspired us. It showed us how marine conservation efforts play such a crucial part in advocating for the protection of our oceans the lungs of our blue planet. At the Gilika Trust we've had quite a lot of damage, um, mainly outside but also to the structure of the building as well, so we don't really know how long it's going to be standing up. Over there, we're probably going 